Hello, welcome to lecture six in the class Communication 1110. The title of this lecture is Preparing Your Tribute Speech. In this class, you will be required to write three preparation outlines in order for you to give your three speeches, the tribute, the informative, and the persuasive. In this lecture, and in the next one, lecture seven, I'm going to go into great detail about how you should go through the process of invention and organization to put together a good, solid preparation outline. You will want to read the chapter on outlining in the textbook as well to help you get some ideas, but, and, uh, but I, this should help you. And you also will want to look at the PowerPoint for some ideas and at the PDF that is provided as well if you are a learner who prefers to read. The tribute speech, just to remind you of some of the requirements that we've probably already mentioned in class, is four to five minutes long. The purpose, and it's very important that you keep the purpose in mind here, as has been mentioned before, the purpose is to explain why you admire or respect a person or an institution or a group of people. For example, do you admire a certain um, singer who has added a lot to the art form that they're involved in but also have hel has helped their community? Are you, do you admire a certain organization such as Ronald McDonald House or the Salvation Army? Or do you admire a group of people such as nurses or coaches or uh, a profession, that kind of thing. Now, I will say that if you choose to do that last category, it's probably because there is a specific person in that profession whom you admire. So you may want to reconsider, instead of speaking about all the coaches or all the nurses, maybe one in particular. But that's up to you. In this speech, you will want to be sure to have stories. Uh, anecdotes because not only are you saying you admire someone but you have to prove why that person is admirable too. Along with this assignment you will as I've said give me a complete preparation outline ahead of time and we will discuss the the deadlines on that in class. It will be turned into turnitin.com for me to review and you will also prepare a one slide PowerPoint presentation where you have a picture of the person or a photograph of the logo or something like that that will show while you are speaking. And it, it helps you a little bit, feel like the pressure's not on you, and it also helps the audience to relate to the idea. So there are some specific uh, rules for doing that. I'd like you to send it to me ahead of time and I'll load it onto the classroom computer, et cetera. So we'll discuss that in class. So those are the specifics, but let me remind you that in this speech you are explaining why you admire someone. So the basic main outline is points of admiration uh, for, your, for this person, not a biographical sketch. And I want you to be very careful that you don't fall into a historical or biographical sketch or history of this person because that's not the point of the assignment and that really is not necessarily uh, helpful to the audience because the whole point is why you admire them. Okay, let's start with the idea of invention. If you'll recall from an earlier lecture, invention is the process of discovering what to say to this particular audience at this particular time for this particular purpose. Now I've just gone through what the purpose of your speech is. And we've mentioned the time. It's also in class. That's the context. But what about your audience? Look around the people in your class. We'll get into this a little bit more later, but what kind of people? Now you've already listened to some speeches. You've done some discussion with each other. What kind of people? I doubt that everyone in the room is the same gender as you. There's probably a mix of gender. Usually at Dalton State, the classes are about 40% male, 60% female. That's sort of the way it goes. Sometimes not that, but you know, pretty much. You probably have some people in your class who are 
either much older than you or much younger than you. If you're a returning student, you may feel like most of the students are 18 years old. If you're 18, it might be kind of unusual to be in class with someone who's in, who is in his or her 40s. So uh, you have a variety of ages. You may have a variety of cultural backgrounds in the class. Not everyone will be like you. There will be diversity in the class. So you have to keep that in mind. You may see the world from a, different pers from a certain perspective, but that doesn't mean that the other people in your class do. So you have to keep in mind what kind of people are in the class. They probably don't even live in the same community that you do. They probably have a plan on having different kinds of jobs than you do. Some of them are married. Some of them have children. So if you are a traditional 18, 19 year old student you, and you're used to being with other people at your age, you may need to get out of that, um, that thought process and think more about different kinds of people who are in the class. And this is one thing that's so great about speech class because you do get to stand up in front of people and get uh, to relate to people who are somewhat different from you and you have to make it interesting for them because you are looking at their faces and they can register confusion or boredom or something like that so it's good practice for you but we're all in this together so that's invention discovering what to say to this particular audience at this particular time for this particular purpose and that brings us to the second point how does a speaker begin to think about invention well you think about those three questions who is my audience? Always. Audience is sovereign. Audience is king. Secondly, what is my context? And the context would, of course, include the, the uh, specifications or the assignment in this case. In other places, it would be more why you were asked to speak, uh, as well as the time limits, things like that, the physical makeup of the room. And then the third question is, who am I? What's interesting to me? What is um, my frame of reference? Why do you admire this person? And that's where you have to start with this speech. As far as the actual process of preparing it, I want you to start not by doing research. I want you to start by sitting by yourself quietly and starting to think of all the reasons why you admire this person, this organization, or these types of people. So that would be a good exercise for you to do. Spend five to ten minutes, block everything out, and think back, why do I admire this person? Is it because of a, a, a characteristic? They, that person is brave. That person is generous. Well, if you say they're generous, what did they do that was generous? So if you write down generous, make, put examples of generous. All the times that person gave sacrificially or, or gave of his or her means. If the person is brave, well, why are they brave? Did they overcome an obstacle in, in life? Did they serve in the military? Did they save someone's life? So you can, you know, you need to sit down and really dig into your mind. Do some critical reflection of why this person is admirable. And you may find that the person you th first thought of, you really, you like them, but you really don't know very much about them and, and uh, don't really admire them after all. So you may have to adjust, but give yourself about 10 minutes to really dig into your memories before you do any research or anything else. I will say this though, if you plan to do a family member, you probably want to go, if that, if that person is alive, go in, and interview that family member. You might be very surprised what you will learn. You may think you know a lot about that family member, your grandpa or your Uncle Bill or somebody like that. But if you really sit down and talk to them, they may surprise you with some stories. Many times my mother, who is in her 80s now, has just all of a sudden said something uh, that she never told us before, that she's remembering. And we just go, Mom, you never told us that. And so, you know, sometimes people and families just act like they know each other and they really don't. So uh, things in their past. You may want to do a little research and do a little interviewing of a family member. But again, uh, we've talked in class about how the family member may not be the best one and you do want to be careful if the person has recently passed away. It might be uh, painful for you to talk about. So that's the first thing. You want to sit down and you want to brainstorm and after you do that it may be necessary for you to do some research. For example, in my uh, example on the uh, PowerPoint that you'll see, I've used Bill Cosby and I've listed 10 things about Bill Cosby that I admire. 
But although I know those things to be true, I don't know the particulars. For example, I don't know how much money he's given to education. So I would need to go research that and find out the actual facts and, and have support for that. So you will have to do some research in some situations. But you sit down and you might come up with 10 or more reasons why you admire this person. And that's a good exercise because you need to always have more to say than you can possibly say. You need to speak from the overflow. And at this point, you probably need to get up, get a cup of coffee or do something else and come back and start to think critically about what's on that list. And this is where the audience part and the context part comes in. You go back to your three questions, who am I, who is the audience, and what is the context, to eliminate some of the ideas that probably won't be applicable. For example, on my list with Bill Cosby, um, I think he's funny, but I, other people don't. And I don't really want to have to in the speech defend his, him being funny. Another thing in that list is that many people today don't realize what a, uh, a big deal it was for him to become a television star and a famous comedian in the early 60s, back when African American people didn't often have those um, types of opportunities. So that's something I would want to communicate uh, to a younger audience who probably only knows him in one context as the Jell-O pudding guy or the Huxtables or something like that or uh, some other TV show. So I go through my list and I decide, mm, don't have time, doesn't really relate, too, uh, too personal, maybe I'll get rid of that, but which ones does my audience really need to know to understand my appreciation for him? So I come down perhaps to three, that he was a breakthrough uh, comedian for African Americans in the early 60s and talk about that, that he is uh, very committed to keeping his shows and his programs family oriented, and that he is very committed to education and supporting education. So those are my three basic reasons, and if you look at the PowerPoint you'll see the uh, the way I've done that as major points. And what you'll notice as, is that I have three. So I started out with ten and I bring it down to three based on my questions that I've asked. Do I have to have three? Well, in a speech the most you should ever have is five. That's the, that is the highest number of main sections or points of a speech you should have. But this is a very short speech. So two or three is, are probably enough. Now you might say, well in English class we always have to have three paragraphs in the middle, three points. Guess what? In speech class you don't have to. If you only have two good reasons why you admire this person, that's fine. As long as you give lots of information about those two points, I'm all right with that. So you can have anywhere between two and five in a speech, but for this one you probably want to stick around with two or three. Okay, that's a, that's a good way to start since you're just beginning. Usually for five main points, that would be a much longer speech, 20 or 30 minutes long. And thankfully, you don't have to do that in this class. That would be asking a lot. So you're now going to take those three, two or three main ideas that you phrased as sentences, as you see on the PowerPoint, and you are going to more or less translate those into a thesis sentence. And, it, and if you have those already written out, it's not very hard to write a thesis sentence. You just combine them and add it to the statement, I respect or I admire this person because, and those are the reasons. In a speech, you don't have to have the three or two main points in the thesis sentence, but you have to give them as an overview anyway. So you can choose to do it in the thesis or you can choose to do it as a separate sentence. I don't have a preference on that. Now there are a few, uh, as we start moving towards developing an outline, and I'll get into that more specifically in the next lecture, keep in mind some points, as far as some, some ideas, as far as your main points that you're developing. Because once you get those two or three main Roman numeral points, you're about 50% there, okay? First of all, two to five, no more, probably two to three for this one. Always keep that in mind. That's a test question, okay? Be very careful that your ideas do not overlap. This is, this is a big deal. They should be discrete. They should be separate. For example, if I had a Roman numeral that I said, Bill Cosby has been very successful, 
and a second one, Bill Cosby has made a lot of money, well, that's really saying the same thing. Okay, or if I had Bill Cosby is very committed to education and a second main point, Bill Cosby is very uh, philanthropic, he gives away a lot of money. Well, most of his money goes to education, so that's really an overlap. They're really, I'm repeating myself. So you don't, uh, you want to be careful that your points are separate ideas, that they aren't saying the same thing. Very important. And if you find yourself doing that, you need to combine them or come up with something else. Um, you want to be sure also that you spend about the same amount of time on each point. You don't want to have Roman numeral one where you only spend 20 seconds on it and Roman numeral two where you spend three minutes on it. That's a not good form. You need to have equal time pretty much for each point. I mean not exactly but pretty much roughly the same amount of time because they're supposed to be equally main points. Another thing that you want to keep in mind is that uh, you should try to organize the points, even at this point uh, in the development of your outline, in some sort of logical order. For example, you might want to do it from the least important to the most important. That's called climax order. Very important point. So for example, I might, because you're students and you're interested in education, I might put the education point last to build up to that. Another reason I might uh, do it that way is that the first point is how he got started as a breakthrough comedian in the 60s. That's early in his life. Then his career, that's the middle, and then his philanthropy in his uh, later years. So that's chronological through his life as well as going to the most important. So you can think about putting your points in an order that makes sense uh, in terms of what you're trying to prove. So those are uh, some basic ideas about starting your development of your outline. In the next lecture, I'm going to get into the specifics of what an outline should look like.